The current consensus is that we should locate our lunar base on the moon's pole, likely around Shackleton Crater because this is where the water and eternal sunlight is. But in this video, I want to make the argument that for industrial sized operations, we are actually better off setting up shop in the Lunar Maria, the gray flat areas once thought to be seas rather than the poles. This is because the Maria have greater benefits to lunar industry than the poles, and the advantages of the poles aren't as great as they may seem when looking at the bigger picture, beyond that of a small research outpost. In order to understand this, we must first ask ourselves, why do we want to go to the moon? For science? We've already done that, and a rover can do it much cheaper. Why do we want to put humans back on the moon? Through tourism and private real estate, we will generate revenue and profit and a demand for infrastructure, which will lead to development and growth, which will allow for the creation of a demand-driven lunar shipbuilding industry, which will pave the way for humanity's expansion into the rest of the solar system. We want to develop the moon, not study it. We want to use it as a giant ball of feedstock material for our glorious solar system spanning civilization, to carve O'Neill cylinders out of its surface, to forge Dyson swarms from regolith. From dust to dust we live, but from lunar crust we ascend. Most serious discussions about setting up a lunar base revolve around mining ice, and as far as we know, most of that ice is located at the lunar poles. Let me be clear, lunar ice will be extremely valuable and useful, not just as drinking water, but because it also contains other valuable volatiles common on Earth but rare on the moon, such as carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Lunar ice is great, but its importance as A or the determining factor in where to locate our lunar economy falls with launch costs. In 2023, the International Space Station's Environmental Control and Life Support System was upgraded to achieve a record 98% water recovery rate. This system treats and recycles all water aboard the ISS, including sewage, wastewater, and humidity scrubbed from the air. And the most impressive part is it was able to achieve this 98% recovery rate despite the fact that the Russian segment is constantly trying to export gas into space to fund its invasion of low Earth orbit. The US, European, Canadian, and Japanese have all tried to levy sanctions on this Russian gas export by patching the known holes, but the Russians have been very good at avoiding these sanctions with their so-called ghost leaks. The main issue is the station is old, and accessing all areas is challenging, which makes locating leaks hard, so they just accept small losses. But if one cares about creating a truly hermetically sealed environment on the moon, accessing the walls will not be a challenge, so it is likely this 2% loss can be further reduced. We'll need to send about 5 liters, 1.3 gallons of water per person up from Earth for basic necessities. If we want to live more comfortably, with hot showers and stuff, it's more like 100 times this amount at around 200 liters or 52 gallons per person. A 200 ton capable super heavy lift rocket full of water would provide 200,000 liters or enough water for 40,000 people to live like they're on the International Space Station, no showers, or enough for 1,000 people to be able to enjoy showers and stuff like on Earth. In a previous video, we discussed the transport costs to the moon based on a thorough study by payload research and concluded on a likely cost per kilogram to the lunar surface of $500, which means each liter of water would cost $500, which is roughly the same price as your typical concert venue water bottle. Except you can reuse this water bottle forever. All you have to do is pay 2% of the original purchasing price for every refill. Put another way, 1,000 people can take showers on the moon for about the same price as a private jet. Every delivery increases our carrying capacity, $100 million at a time. This seems expensive, but let me rephrase it. For the low, low price of $1 billion, we could import enough water to increase our luxurious lunar carrying capacity to 10,000. And if they're instead living like belters, 
then it's more like 400,000 people. For the cost of NASA's SLS system, we could have 118,000 perfumey smelling people or 4.7 million stinky spacemen. We will have a 2% loss, which can be easily replenished through more imports combined with the small amount of water we gain from electrolysis of lunar regolith, which will yield about 12 ounces of water per cubic meter, and any ice found in crater pits will go far in helping to close this gap. If we happen to find a few massive chunks of ice, 100,000 liters worth of water, then cool, we just saved ourselves $50 million. And so you can see how the water ice prospecting economy would begin. Again, ice is very useful. We should actively seek out and try to mine it, and we definitely shouldn't waste it as rocket fuel. I mean, my god, what a waste that would be. But our recycling and import capabilities would be good enough that its importance as the determining factor in locating a lunar base is greatly diminished. The other main reason Shackleton Crater and the poles in general look appealing as a place to set up shop is that some polar crater rims receive almost constant sunlight allowing us to harness solar energy even through the long lunar night. This is no trivial thing. On the moon there is no wood, no coal, no oil, no natural gas, no wind, no rivers, nothing. But there is an abundance, an excess, an absolutely overwhelming amount of raw, unfiltered sunlight. Free energy blasted across the lunar surface cooking anything and everything during the 14 and a half Earth days long lunar day, immediately followed by an equally long 14 and a half Earth days of freezing cold, energy sucking darkness during the long lunar night. But the constant light beaming across the slim tops of crater ridges offers a solution. Constant energy, 24-7, or uh, I guess 708-29.5 on the moon? Since this electricity is intended to power life support systems and stuff, a better way to think about this is in terms of how much habitable space we get per watt. The International Space Station has an internal pressurized volume of 916 cubic meters equal to that of a Boeing 747 and hosts seven astronauts continuously and uses 80 kilowatts of power to cool the station and power all the life support and communication systems. In other words, it costs 87 watts to keep a single cubic meter habitable and each human requires about 100 cubic meters. Let's just round that up to 100 watts per cubic meter. So for a 1000 cubic meter habitat, a little larger than the International Space Station, as large as Starship's fairing, we'd require 100 kilowatts of power continuously. But the problem with the crater rim approach is this solution is limited to a certain predefined geographic area. First, we need to understand the scale and scope of what we're actually talking about. Let's use Shackleton Crater as our case study. The entire crater isn't constantly lit. Look at this time lapse on screen for a better idea, but if you're just listening, the light essentially crawls around the crater. And so of course you might think, well, just put solar panels all around it. But Shackleton Crater is huge, it's 21 kilometers across, about the size of a city, and deeper than the Grand Canyon, so it's not an easy task to just cover the entire thing in solar panels. And even if you did, only about half of them would be receiving light at any given moment. But there are a few unique, special spots around the crater that do receive an abnormally high amount of sunlight year round. This study literally just calls them spots 1, 2, and 3, and they represent the best case scenarios in which a solar panel array elevated 10 meters or 32 feet above the ground would receive only about 3 days or 72 hours of continuous darkness. This is much better than the typical lunar night, but it's still much longer than your typical nights here on Earth, unless you live near one of Earth's poles. Funny how that works. The total solar irradiance is 1,360 watts per square meter, so a 30% efficient panel would generate about 400 watts per square meter. How much energy could be generated in these spots really depends on how large you can make your solar panel array suspended 10 meters high. But no matter how much you can generate, 
your need to store that same amount of energy for 72 hours at a time remains the same. In other words, storage scales with production. Well, technically with consumption, but consumption increase is implied with generation. A 1,000 cubic meter habitat would be large enough for 7 to 10 people, and referring to our 100 watts per cubic meter figure from before, would require 100 kilowatts to keep habitable. 100 kilowatts would be generated by 250 square meters of solar panels, and this configuration would require 7.2 megawatt hours of storage to make it through that pesky 72 hours of darkness. For 10,000 cubic meters capable of hosting 100 humans, we would need a whopping 72 megawatt hours of grid storage. For 1,000 people, we'd need an insane 720 megawatt hours of storage to last the shortest lunar night possible. If we import batteries, the cost will be very high. While not necessarily optimized for space, just to get an idea, the Tesla Megapack uses very high quality lithium ion batteries and has a storage capacity of 3.9 megawatt hours, so we'd need about two of them to keep 10 people alive for 72 hours. Two batteries would cost about 2 million, but this cost pales in comparison to the ultimate cost of transporting them from Earth to the Moon. The Megapack weighs 38,100 kilograms, giving us an energy density of about 105 watts a kilogram, and we need two units for a total of 76,200 kilograms. Once again, referencing our $500 cost per kilogram to the lunar surface from a previous video, we would have a battery transport cost of 38.1 million, so about 40 million to keep 10 people alive, or $400 a watt. The largest cost here comes from the fact that batteries are heavy piles of materials. But maybe we can produce batteries on the moon domestically to save some of that battery import cost. The moon has basically no carbon or lithium, but it does have sodium. So let's see what it would take to make sodium batteries on the moon, and if that's something we might want to do. The carbon anode makes up about 20% of the battery by weight. And we have to import carbon regardless, so we can't really get around this. But a 200 ton ship importing graphite would allow for the creation of 1 million kilograms of batteries, which at 100 watt hours a kilogram would be 100 megawatts, or about 0.1 gigawatts per ship import. Sodium is present on the moon at 3,000 parts per million on average, and I couldn't find an exact component breakdown by mass for sodium batteries, but given that they function roughly similar to lithium ion, of which lithium makes up 7% of the entire battery by weight, it's relatively safe to say sodium would be roughly proportional, although sodium ions are a little bit bigger, so they take up more volume and are lighter. Anyways, I also calculated the mass percentage of sodium in the anode of this particular sodium battery chemistry and got about 14%. And given that the anode likely makes up about 50% of the battery, half of 14 is 7, so that's in line with the lithium estimate. So let's just say our sodium battery would have 10% sodium just to be generous. Sodium ion batteries have power densities of about 100 watt hours a kilogram. So to make enough sodium batteries to achieve 7.2 megawatt hours of storage, we'd need 7.2 tons of sodium. At 3,000 parts per million, we'd need to excavate 2,400 tons of regolith to gather enough sodium for a small 10-person base. For this extraction, you'll need to spend energy to excavate and melt the material to separate it and while we don't know how much energy would be required in excavating, we do know melting regolith requires about half a megawatt hour a ton, so 2,400 tons would require about 1,200 megawatt hours to get capacity to store 7.2 megawatt hours. So the difference between how much energy you need to store and how much energy it would cost to make the ability to store that energy is three orders of magnitude. 1.21 gigawatts! 1.21 gigawatts! Great Scott! 
Now, the whole point is to get to the point where we are excavating square kilometers worth of lunar regolith, tens of thousands of tons of materials a day, and making sodium batteries domestically to power things. And we would use the other stuff that isn't sodium, all the iron and oxygen and silicon and everything else, it's not just wasted. But spending 1.2 gigawatt hours for 10 humans is much worse than just importing lithium ion batteries, so domestic battery production is a non-starter until we've already got a massive kilometer consuming industry underway. But what about fuel cells? Fuel cells work like batteries, but use electrolysis to store energy in the form of hydrogen and oxygen gas, making them much lighter than batteries. During the day, excess solar power would be used to electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen gas, which would need to be liquefied and stored in a pressurized tank. During the night, the hydrogen gas and oxygen would be recombined to create water, giving off heat and generating electricity. Today on Earth, fuel cells are more complicated and expensive to manufacture than batteries, which is why they're not used more commonly. But those that are, are usually air breathing, only storing hydrogen gas and combining it with oxygen from the air to generate electricity, heat, and water, which is then expelled as waste. Additionally, the hydrogen gas itself is recharged using a pressure vessel not made by the fuel cell itself. The gas is made in a facility and shipped to the cell, so it's more like a fuel-consuming generator, an environmentally friendly replacement for diesel generators, than a battery. But if all the hydrogen and oxygen is recaptured and fed back into the same system, so there is no loss and the golden rule of chemistry applies, then it is a regenerative fuel cell. Regenerative fuel cells are self-contained systems that only consume electricity and only release heat and electricity, just like a battery. But these kinds of systems are even more complicated to produce, more expensive to manufacture, and so they haven't really seen any uses here on Earth outside of the laboratory. But they have higher specific energy densities than batteries, more watts per kilogram, and because transport costs rather than manufacturing costs make up the bulk of our expense in space, the equation flips, and all of a sudden RFCs look much more appealing than batteries for space applications, which is why NASA has been researching and developing these recently, but because of a lack of terrestrial uses and therefore private industry interest, data on these systems has been very, very hard to find. In other words, RFCs are still lodged deep in NASA's developmental crack, and fishing out useful info like power density specs and procurement costs requires a ton of patient, thoughtful digging. Fortunately, this rat was able to scavenge up a few meager morsels of info to help ease our information-starved appetites. First, I talked to a friend, much more familiar with fuel cells and cryogenic stuff, and he estimated that to achieve the necessary 7.2 megawatt hours of storage needed for our shortest of lunar nights, for our smallest of lunar bases, we'd need 3 to 5 tons of equipment. But not wanting to just take his word for it, I still continue to search and search for official data, combing over more documents and publications than I can remember until at the bottom of a well I found gleaming this beautiful and ancient NASA presentation from 2019. And within this 25 page presentation I found this one single slide showing, finally, at long last, a bar graph revealing that a 10 kilowatt RFC would weigh about 1.3 tons for a 3 days dark situation, meaning for our 10 person 100 kilowatt base we need a 13 ton RFC, which would result in a launch cost of just 6.5 million. While there's no unit production price, we can guesstimate by looking at non-regenerating hydrogen fuel cells to get a ballpark range. Most of the expensive materials like proton exchange membranes and platinum group metals are in this part here, and the regenerative aspect mostly involves cheaper materials like piping and pumps and pressure vessels. This 5 kilowatt fuel cell costs 20,000, so about $4,000 per kilowatt, so we can guess our 100 kilowatt RFC would cost at least $400,000. And to cover the cost of those extra components, we can just round up to half a million, 
giving us a total cost of about $7 million for 10 people, or $70 per watt, 82% cheaper than lithium ion batteries. Now, note this is a lot of napkin math, so it is likely to be off by some margin. But if someone has the data, please let us know in the comments. So RFCs are better than batteries, but how do they stack up to nuclear energy? Traditional radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, used in many satellites and rovers, including the Mars rovers, can be thought of more as nuclear batteries rather than nuclear generators, and they are extremely reliable but only produce about 100 watts of electricity and weigh about 40 kilograms, or 2.5 watts per kilogram, worse than batteries. However, they don't need any energy storage. They run even in the dark, so for a 100 kilowatt 10 person base, you would need to import about a thousand of them, weighing about 40,000 kilograms, which would cost about 20 million. The MMRTGs used in the Mars rovers cost an estimated 109 million to manufacture. But if we manufactured a thousand of them, we could likely re reduce the unit cost to $100,000 or less, but this would still cost $120 million for both procurement and transportation, or $1,200 per watt, three times as much as batteries. Fortunately, since 2015, NASA has been developing the Kilo Power Reactor, which is way better than RTGs, and future designs planned for Mars are projected to produce 10 kilowatts each and weigh 1,500 kilograms, yielding about 6 watts per kilogram. For a 10-person base, you would only need 10 of these, 15,000 kilograms, or 7.5 million in transport costs, and the one produced by NASA only costs 20 million to manufacture, so producing 10 of them for a 10-person base might cost something like 2 million each, although we'd likely produce much more, but just for an idea, let's say 2 million each, which is a high-end estimate resulting in a total cost of about $27.5 million, or only $275 per watt, 31% cheaper than batteries. And remember, we didn't even include the cost of solar panels with both the battery and fuel cell configurations. But it's unlikely these designs will ever be picked up and mass-produced by private companies because the private sector is already working on even more promising micro-reactors. Trisulfuel fuel modular micro-reactors are currently in development and making rapid progress by companies such as X-Energy, Radiant Nuclear, BWXT, Rolls-Royce, and more. These reactors can generate an impressive 1 to 7 megawatts of electricity, and can fit into a standard shipping container and be trucked to any site, including the moon. At the time of writing, there is no unit price, and predicting future costs of technologies not yet developed is a complex exercise that includes many uncertain parameters and functional forms. However, Stegervald et al. 2023 created a predictive model that accurately estimates a range of potential construction costs for SMR projects by doing a whole bunch of stuff which I'll throw up on screen. Among the 19 reactors analyzed by Stegervald und Freunden, two are high temperature gas cooled SMRs that utilize triso fuel in a pebble bed configuration, while another is a triso fuel block micro reactor. Their cost estimates for these reactors are 5 million, 400,000, 1 million, 550,000, and 5 million, 700,000, respectively. Although N only equals 3, the average price comes out to 4 million, 200,000. However, considering the uncertainties and the unique challenges of lunar deployment, it's prudent to err on the side of caution. Therefore, let's do something crazy, like double the estimated cost, leading to a price tag of $10 million for our reactor. As for their weight, it varies, but really, its size matters more, ranging in around 12 meters or 40 feet. They'll likely consume most of the usable fairing of a ship. So instead of measuring in kilograms, we just add a launch cost of 100 million, which is equal to that of the $500 kilogram cost used for the others. So 10 million per unit plus another 100 million to get that unit to the moon gives a total of 110 million for 2 to 7 megawatts. Let's say 2 megawatts for conservative margins, which is about $55 a watt, 85% less than the cost of batteries. How could I have been so careless? 1.21 gigawatts! Tom, how am I going to generate that kind of power? It can't be done, can it? 
Black. But all we need is a little plutonium. <laughs> So hopefully it's obvious nuclear power is the best option because it never stops producing energy, even when the sun goes down. Any location where there's a nuclear reactor is a location without darkness. It's eternal sunshine and a jar. Combine this with the new revelation that we don't actually need to rely on lunar ice. We can import our water without busting the bank and what we've got, ladies and gentlemen, is a paradigm shift. But if we aren't considering water and sunlight, then what metric should we look for in this new paradigm? Well, how about terrain accessibility and regolith quality? Assuming we have ample energy and water, the next most important thing becomes accessibility and resource abundance, as these are the factors which matter the most for industrial purposes. The Maria regions are flat. This makes landing much easier. Just ask Intuitive Machine CEO Steve Elipmus. But more importantly, it makes building stuff much easier. I hate urban sprawl as much as the next guy, but flat cities are larger and have lower costs of living because the construction is simpler, and the ability to spread out in any direction results in a much greater supply of real estate. This is a huge and massively overlooked benefit both in the near and long term, as it makes constructing everything easier from simple roads to rails to kilometers long mass drivers. And as if that wasn't enough to convince you in favor of the Maria regions, to top it all off, the regolith located in the Maria has more of the stuff we want to use and less of the stuff we don't want to use, while the regolith in the highland regions has more of the stuff we don't want to use at the expense of the stuff we do want to use. Highland regolith has less. Less iron, less sodium, less magnesium, less titanium, but it has more aluminum, silicon, calcium, and oxygen. We already have tons of oxygen and silicon and enough calcium for whatever we'd use that for, and aluminum is useful but it makes little difference if it is 5 or 10%, that's still plenty. A 5% difference in iron and magnesium and chromium has a much larger impact because we want to use much more of those elements to make steel. So in the highlands, you're essentially trading higher quality steel and easy terrain for a tad bit more aluminum and silicon and sunshine, which isn't a good trade in my book. At the end of the day, in order to avoid the night at Shackleton Crater, we would need to lay massive amounts of solar panels over an area about 30 kilometers in diameter, multiple square kilometers worth of solar panels and transmission lines. This would be useful but it makes sense that you would do something like this once you've already got a lunar industry going, and it makes sense to put that lunar industry in the Maria regions. It's also questionable if, by that point in time, by the time you could actually do something like this, it would even be worth it considering you would also likely be able to launch power satellites and reflective orbital mirrors to achieve constant solar power even at the poles or mass produce tons of cheap metal oxygen batteries and thermal wadis, more on that later. And all right, the last point I wanted to make regarding lunar location is to note the tendency for momentum, known and explored territory coupled with the ease of connection. Wherever we set up shop, once power and water and oxygen inhabit habitable spaces on the moon, their mere existence greatly lowers the cost of entry to any further development. So, by establishing a base at Shackleton, we may be inadvertently shackling ourselves to the poles. Alright, before the video ends, I just wanted to quickly tell you that I've now made my book How to Develop the Moon free for all. I do realize that making this free will likely make you, the general audience, value it less because I've technically valued it at zero dollars, so it must be worthless. But the reason I did this is because I'm actually a worthless idealist, and I want information to be as accessible as possible. Physical copies are for sale on Amazon, but they only cost the price of production, materials, and labor, so just know I make nothing from it, non-profit. But if you read it and find value in it, then please consider dropping a tip my way via Ko-fi or Patreon. 
Thank you to the Patreon and channel members who make these videos possible. It is because of your contributions and the fact that people actually watch this channel that I'm able to make the book free and spend the massive amounts of time researching and writing required to make these videos. Thank you.